Good morning. Can you hear me? Please let me know. Good morning, Anthony Brown. Good morning, Nina. Thank you. Please let me know if you are watching. Amen. Sister Carletta, good morning. Great. Thank you so much. Is there any static this morning? Good morning, Sister Jackie, Sister Cunningham. Good morning, Sister Georgia. Sister Lavinia. We'll be getting started in about one minute. Gloria, great. Sister Ramona, if you're there, good morning as well. Good morning, and welcome to the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church Saturday morning breakfast Bible study. I am so glad to have you with us this morning. If you are there, please let me know. Just uh, type in a hello or how are you. Um, I, I would love to know if you are present with us this morning. Amen. Um, we thank you so much uh, for tuning in and joining us, and we pray that you are getting um, something out of the study of God's Word. Um, some of you have asked if it is possible to uh, have a question and answer section. If you would like to have a question and answer section, either at the end of the Bible study or sometime during the week, please let me know that in your comment section so I can try to uh, plan time for questions and answers. Uh, or you can submit your questions and I can try to answer them, uh, take some from uh, the, the comments that, that you make. Let us pray. Dear God, please send now your Holy Spirit to teach us what you would have us to know about you today. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Amen. Last week, we looked at reconciliation, which means that we have made an appointment with God to walk with Him on a journey called life to a final destination, which is not death, but life eternal. We looked at it in terms of Amos 3.3, 3. do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? We also briefly introduced the term atonement or at one 
meant. And I did a little more research on it, and I'd like to share with you several definitions that I found. One of them I found most interesting. The English word for atonement originally meant at one meant or at one with, like being in harmony with someone. And in this case, it means to be at one with God through the atonement that was made possible by the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf. That means that Christ died in our place. We should have died, but we did not die. He died in our place. Substitutionary death. The Hebrew word for atonement is kippur. K-I-P-U-R. With the verb form being kafar. K-A-P-H-A-R. And that means to cover, purge, make reconciliation, and to cover with or coat with pitch. Now, that last definition is very interesting because the same Hebrew word used for pitch is kephar. K-A-P-H-A-R. And that is what the ark was covered with. You remember the ark. It was uh, when the flood came and God said that he was going to wipe out everybody except for Noah, his wife, his children, which were three, and their wives. And he was supposed to take two of every animal and put it on the ark with him which he did, and he covered the ark with pitch. When God commanded Noah to build an ark to save him, his family, and many of the animals from the coming judgment of the flood, he was commanded to cover the ark with pitch or kafor, which is to cover, make reconciliation with, or to purge. Since the floodwaters were indicative of the judgment of God on fallen, sinful mankind, it is not ironic that God used the word kafor in telling Noah to cover the ark with pitch. Thus, the ark is seen as symbolic of God's salvation and the atonement or covering from God's judgment of the floodwaters as seen in the pitch that Noah applied to the outside of the ark, whereby God spared Noah and his family from the judgment of sin by an atoning, reconciling, covered, or covering that the pitch was known for. This is indicative of salvation being fully a work of God and not of man. That's why uh, Ephesians 2, 8 said, for, let's look at it, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians is in the New Testament, chapter 2, verse 8. And verse 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, Noah couldn't save himself. Only God could save Noah. And he saved him by placing he, his wife, and his family in an ark which was covered with pitch, which means kafor, which means covered, covering, and reconciliation. Now, to continue the idea of reconciliation is an appointment with God at, an ex at a designated place, the place being where you have made a conscious decision to stop being an enemy to God, doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, just because you are big and bad enough to do it, and go on a journey where you go from who you are to who he is, to reach an agreed upon final destination, which is life eternal.
Let me say that one more time. Reconciliation is an appointment with God at a designated place. The place being where you have made a conscious decision to stop being an enemy to God. Doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, just because you are big and bad enough to do it. And to go on a journey where you go from who you are to who he is. To reach an agreed upon final destination which is life eternal. You come to God just as you are. But God loves you so much that he does not leave you as you are. Now, when we look at eternal life, I don't know what we're thinking of, but the Bible defines eternal life in John 17 and 3. Let's turn to it. The Gospel of John 17 and 3. Now, The Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3. And that's in the New Testament. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What better way to learn who God is than to walk with God? What better way to learn and know who Jesus Christ is than to walk with Jesus the Christ? Reconciliation in and of itself means that you are making peace. Now, I said you are making peace, but actually you don't have nothing to do with it. God has made peace on your behalf. How'd that happen? Well, let's continue to study. Let us turn to 1 Peter, the second chapter. 1 Peter, that's in the New Testament, toward the back. Look in the table of contents if you cannot find it. 1 Peter, the second chapter. And begin at the 11th verse. First Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. War, enemy. Fleshly lust is an enemy against your soul. There's a war going on. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king or as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Listen, listen at this version from the Berean Study Bible. It says, And do this, understanding the occasion. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day, the day has drawn near. So I lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Instead, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Let me check something. You have to do something different when you get ready to take this journey with God. You have to be in the right mindset. And next week we're going to talk about righteousness. Righteousness. Job 29 and 14 says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Justice was my robe and turban. You've got to take off the old clothes the old man, and put on new clothes and a new man. Galatians 3 and 27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Okay, when we're talking about reconciliation, we're talking about taking off something and putting on something else. You can't stay the same and have and make peace and walk with God. Now, uh, I want to I want to ask you to turn to Proverbs, the second chapter, because I want to give you some idea of what you're going to be learning along this journey. And I have it in two versions, the NIV and the NCV, which is the New Century version. The NIV and the NCV, which is the New Century version. Beginning at the first verse. The second verse, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. What are you going to be doing on this journey? You're going to be learning. Learning to accept the words of God. You're going to learn how to store up His commands within you. You're going to learn to turn your ear to His wisdom and not the wisdom of man. You're going to apply your hearts to understanding. You're going to call out for insight, and you're going to cry aloud for understanding. And you're going to understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of the Lord. Why? For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand. When you're walking with God, there are some things that you're going to begin to understand along the journey. You will understand what is right and just and fair and every good path. How will you do that? Verse 10, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. Uh, you won't be following the crowd. You won't be out there with John Doe and, and Mary Sue and Sally, and, and you'll, be, you'll be saved from the ways of wicked men. 
from men whose words are perverse. Have you ever wondered how you ever got up in some kind of trouble? When you walk in with God, God sees all, God knows all, he protects all, he provides for you. He can see around the corners and he will save you from wicked men whose words are perverse, who have left straight paths to walk in dark paths, whose delight is in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who have left the par partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. Note it didn't say marriage or contract, the covenant she made before God. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain paths of life when you are walking with God, you're going to a, a final destination. That destination is life, abundant life, and life eternal. Thus, you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the faithful will be torn from it. I am sure there are other passages of scripture that you can find that will support walking with God as a journey. But to me, that passage in Proverbs gives me all the reason that I need to stay with God. Stay with God. To walk with Him. To try to keep my commitment that God, I don't want to be over here and out there and be an enemy to you. I want to make peace with you. And I want to, I want to follow you. And I want to follow your ways. Now, let's turn to the New Testament, to the book of Romans, and go to the fifth chapter. And let's start at the sixth birth. Now, the term reconciliation is a term brought about by Paul. Paul uses this term in his letters. And this is the letter to the church at Rome. And we're going to read from verse 6 to verse 11 in chapter 5. For when we were, and I'm reading from the King James Version now, beginning at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, I always circles those two words when I find them together. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, circle though that word right there, for and if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now we have now received the atonement. 
Now, a reason why I asked you to circle for if. Because if here uh, means a fulfilled condition. In other words, for if should be translated since. Since, because it's a fact. It is a fact. It's not if, maybe so, maybe not. For if, translated here from the Greek, should be the word since. Because it's a fact. Since, while we were enemies. Because it's a fact. We were enemies with God. Because God hates sin. And we are sinners. We are sinners. That's our nature. We have a sin nature. So we are at war with the ways of God. While we were enemies, while we were enemies, God, we were, it should say, God reconciled us. We were reconciled to God. God did the reconciling. Have. God initiates and empowers the reconciliation through the death of his son, Jesus the Christ. So if we wanted to read that verse with some clear understanding, we would say, verse 10, Since we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Jesus the Christ. We had nothing to do with that. God did all of that. He reconciles us. He wants us to have peace with him. God so loved us. Not that we so love God, but God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, the Bible says, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have Life eternal. So let's let's look at this in the New Living Translation. Because some people like to read the King James and they don't quite understand what they're reading. That's okay. Pick up another version of the Bible. Get a version that you understand when you read it. Let's look at the New Living Translation. Same passage. Romans 5, 6 through 11. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Verse 10, for since our friendship with God, was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. You still don't get it? Let's look at the New Century Version. Same passage. When we were unable to help ourselves, at the right time, Christ died for us, although we were living against God. Very few people will die to save the life of someone else, although perhaps for a good person, somebody, someone might possibly die. But God shows his great love for us in this way. Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. 
So through Christ, we will surely be saved from God's anger because we have been made right with God by the blood of Christ's death. While we were God's enemies, he made us his friends through the death of his son. Surely, now we are his friends. He will save us through his son's life. And not only that, but now we are also very happy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we are now God's friends again. Reconciliation is God moving from being your enemy. And the word that sometimes we see is in, in, enmity. E-N-M-I-T-Y. Enmity. To establishing a friendship. Amity or amity. A-M-I-T-Y. Relationship. Reconciliation is God. Moving from being your enemy to establishing a friendship relationship with you by loving you so much that he sent himself wrapped in flesh and named Jesus the Christ to die in your place one time as full payment for your sins in order that the sentence of death could be removed from you, a pardon granted, and you receive life and life eternal. You are not reconciled to God by anything that you do or have done or will do. You are reconciled to God because God first loved you, and because he loved you, he chose not to remain an enemy to you, but to make peace with you by sending the Prince of Peace. To come on his behalf and extend to you the offer of peace. What does it mean to have peace with God? What does it mean to have peace with God? If you remember the Christmas story. The angel's words to the shepherds on that first Christmas was, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Yes, I, I have a different version. That's Luke, the second chapter, and the 14th verse. With whom God is pleased. God's pleasure and peace rest upon those who receive God's Son by faith. Look at Romans 5 and 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we get the peace. Through Jesus the Christ. Peace with God means that our great sin debt has been paid. And, and, and let me just stop right there and put it in, in, in words that we can understand. Listen here. When folk owe you money, right? Folk owe you a debt, they generally run away from you. They don't want to see you coming. They, 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 they go the opposite direction. We owe Jesus a debt. We owe God a debt. We didn't want to see God coming. We couldn't pay. But God knew that we owed him a debt that we could not repay. And God sees that. And God sent Jesus to pay our debt in full. That's how much he loves us. You know, if you told the brother man, listen, I know you know you owe me hundred dollars, but I have decided, man, our our friendship means too much for us to be. I'm gonna call it Eve. You don't owe me the hundred dollars no more. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh call it pay. That man, what? You love me that much? 
You going to forget that I owe you hundred dollars? That's how much God loved you. He sent Jesus to pay a debt he did not owe on our behalf so that there could be peace between God and man. Between God and man. That's how God reached down while man and took the hand of man so that peace could be made through the cross. God, man, man couldn't help himself. God reached down, grabbed his hand, pulled him up. Peace through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let us let us look at uh, Ephesians. When we get to Ephesians, I want us to go to the second chapter and the fourteenth verse. Ephesians, the second chapter, and the fourteenth verse. And in the first time, I'm going to read it in the King James Version. And I'm going to read the 14th through the 18th verses. For he is our peace. For he is our peace, who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Listen at it again in the easy reading version. Christ is the reason we are now at peace. He made us Jews, and you who are not Jews, one people. We were separated by a wall of hate that stood between us. But Christ broke down that wall by giving his own body. Christ ended the law with its many commands and rules. His purpose was to make the two groups become one in him. By doing this, he would make peace. Through the cross, Christ ended the hate between the two groups. And after they became one body, he wanted to bring them both back to God. He did this with his death on the cross. Christ came and brought the message of peace to you, non-Jews, who were far away from God. And he brought that message of peace to those who were near to God. Yes, through Christ, we all have the right to come to the Father in one spirit. Look at 1 Timothy 2 and 5. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. For there is one God, back in the King James Version, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Romans 5 and 1, we've already read. Acts, let's go to Acts, the third chapter.
and third in the fifteenth verse. Acts the third chapter and the fifteenth verse. And killed the prince of life, whom God have raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And killed the, 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 the NIV says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. First John 5. And twenty. First John chapter five, toward the end of the Bible, verse twenty. And we know that the Son of God is come, and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him. That is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. John 14, back to the gospel of John. John 14, the 27th verse. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you were going to substitute Shirley Caesar's song, this peace I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it away. Oh. Uh, Romans 6 and 23, very famous. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isaiah 57 and 19. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Isaiah 57, verse 19. Look at what it say. I create the fruits of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Let us talk about what are we supposed to do now that we have this peace and understand that God is the author of this peace and that God has allowed us to have to make reconciliation with him through the peace that he has given us through the shed blood of Christ Jesus. Uh, let us turn. to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. Second Corinthians, the 5th chapter. And we get to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. As soon as I get there myself, I'm almost there. Uh, let us begin 
where it says at the 20th verse, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The ambassador. And let's take a look at that word ambassador. We're familiar with it. The United States sends an ambassador to France. The ambassador is a U.S. citizen who goes to a foreign territory, who lives in an embassy, which is considered a little piece of ground that belongs to the United States in France. So when the ambassador gets to France, the ambassador is on U.S. soil at the embassy while he is in a foreign country. The ambassador doesn't speak on his own. He speaks as a representative of the president of the United States. Uh, he is an official representative of the United States, or she, in a foreign country. Now, hold your fingers right here at 2 Corinthians and turn to Ephesians. The second chapter. And the 19th verse. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. What? When you make peace with God and belong to God, you no longer of the world. You change citizenships. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. You belong to God's household. Philippians 3 and 20. G-E-P-C, remember? Philippians verse 20 for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are ambassadors here on earth, sent to a foreign land. At earth, see, once we get to be with God, make peace with God, we become part of God's household. We love the things that God loves. We walk with God. We're supposed to be on a journey with God to a final destination. We, we have left the things of the world behind. They are foreign to us. So we are living in, in a world that is not ours anymore. We are not citizens of the world. We are citizens in God's family in Heaven. We are citizens of heaven. I just had a thought. That's why I got to say, I have gone to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there ye may be also. You are a citizen in heaven. He has prepared a place for you. Hallelujah. 
You don't belong to the world anymore. You now have a, a, a job to do, and that is to be an ambassador on behalf of Christ. And what is the message that you are supposed to speak? It is supposed to be a message of peace. A message of peace. God does not want to war with people. God does not want to war with people, for he desires that none should perish. As an ambassador, we are sent to represent God in our little spots here on the earth, which is heaven the ground, the ground we stand on is holy, because God is holy, and we are in God's family, and we no longer sojourn in here in the world, we don't do the things of the world anymore. That's why you can't have one foot on God's ground and one foot in the world. Either you in God's house or you not in God's house. Either the light is on in you or the light is off. Either you live in, in light or you live in darkness. That is the message that we bring. A message of peace. A message that says to the world, God loves you. And he loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross. So that y'all can stop being enemies with each other and be friends. Isn't it wonderful to have God? As a friend. Listen. I have one more passage of scripture. That talks about the ministry of reconciliation. And, and that is the ministry that we have. It is the message of reconciliation. It is the message of peace. Since we then know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain also to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than it is what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That is the message of reconciliation that we are supposed to give, that Christ died. One time for all of us, no matter how horrible the stuff you may have done, God can make peace, has already made peace with you. You don't have to run from God. You don't have to hide. He already knows and he sees you and he loves you anyhow. Just as you are. For while you were always out, already out there, doing all that stuff that you're trying to run and hide from God, God saw you and He loved you and He made a way on the cross to reach down. Through the body of his son, Jesus the Christ. And grab your hand. And say, I'm making a way for you to get back to me. I don't want us to be enemies anymore. I want us to be friends. So through the blood of my son, Jesus the Christ. I am washing you 
clean. And I'm bringing you to be at one with me. At one with me. This is a journey upon which we have embarked. And what is the primary purpose of the journey? What are we looking for on this journey? What are we seeking according to the New Testament? Turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, the sixth chapter. And begin at the 25th verse. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Beginning at the 25th verse. And he says, Therefore, again I'm reading from the King James. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought. For your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what she shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Listen, Abraham said he was Jehovah Jireh, that God sees and provides. If we walk in with God, God is our Jehovah Jireh. Therefore, we have to take no thought. Look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? God didn't say that he so loved the fowl of the air. God said he so loved you. So loved you. 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith though shall we be clothed? So we don't have to worry about material things while we're on our journey. God sees, and God prepares. So what are we supposed to be doing out there? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Here we go. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The primary purpose for us while we on this journey is to seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, the righteousness of God, and all these things will be given to you as well. I'm going to close with this. What is the kingdom of God? John the 18th chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The 18th chapter. And the 36th verse says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. So the kingdom of God is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. 
Don't we pray that kingdom come? Do we really want Jesus' kingdom to come? Its kingdom is not of this world. So then where is or what is God's kingdom? We want to get a clear understanding. 1 Corinthians, the 4th chapter and the 20th verse. 1 Corinthians, the 4th chapter and the 20th verse. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What kind of power? I wish I had time to really go into that to that power. But but for, 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 let me let me just simply say, suffice it to say, Isaiah 10 27, refer back to that when you get a minute. It's the burden removing and yoke destroying power of God. It, 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 that the verse says, "It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will t be taken away from your shoulder, burden removing, and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed, yoke destroying, because of the anointing oil, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one." Anointed, smeared all over with the power of God. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It's in power, not of this world. So, so what is the kingdom of God? Romans 14 and 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Well, we already know that because God said he's going to provide all of that. So it's got to be something else. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's the burden of removing yoke destroying power of God which produces in us righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost overflowing power Woo. listen Luke 17 Luke 17 Luke 17 20 and 21 And when he, Jesus, was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Huh. All right now. All righty now. Now we got a word. God has made peace so that we can walk with him to a final destination, which is life eternal. And how are we going to walk with him? We are going to walk with him because we are going to have the kingdom of God within us. We're going to have the burden removing, yoke destroying, power of God. Huh. Within us. That is going to cause us or produce in us or result in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's a word. Yes, sir. That's a word. That's a word. Hallelujah. That's a word. That's why we, we want to be reconciled with God. We don't want to be his enemy. We need the power. We need the power. 
within us. We need his power within us. For in him we move and have our being. Amen. Praise God. We thank you so much for joining us today for our Saturday morning breakfast Bible study. We pray that you have gotten a word. We pray that uh, you will join us again next week at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time right here. If you would like to listen to the lesson again, it will be available to you on YouTube. Uh, later this afternoon and you can play it back as many times as you would like. It will also be available on Facebook on the Patton Memorial uh, CME Church page so that you can um, look at it again and again. Again, thank you for sharing your Saturday morning with us. God bless you and be safe.